So ladies and gentlemen, if you can give a, a warm round of applause to Jaume Sanchez. Thank you. Hello. Hello, everyone. Uh, first, uh, welcome. I want to thank the organization of Future GS for getting this uh, going, which is awesome. Um, I'm going to be talking about uh, Web Audio, the Web Audio API. Uh, this is an example of uh, a free JS interactive uh, um, rendering using Web Audio. Uh, I'm going to explain how can you get all the nodes and all the functions that the Web Audio API provides to create something like this, uh, which is um, several specialization components and creating uh, sequences of, of uh, sound effects that you can trigger and schedule and most of covering most of the basis of uh, Web Audio API. So I'm going to be using uh, slides.com. Uh, it's the first time I've used it, so I have no idea if, if this is actually going to go all the way through. But uh, yeah, first slide. OK. So uh, audio on the browser. Um, for many years, we only had um, a reduced number of solutions to play back audio on our web pages, which were basically uh, depending on uh, external plugins like Flash or QuickTime, or at some point, uh, we were depending on the codecs of the system, which was a really dark time for, for multimedia on the web. Then it came uh, a few years ago with the, uh, with the um, operation of HTML5. Uh, we've got the audio element which is a pretty nice solution to embed uh, native elements in our web pages as images or text. We also have a video and audio. But it's, uh, it was basically defined to go um, to be like a, a, playback, a playback experience. We could change the volume. We could stop it. But there, there wasn't much that we could do. Uh, for many experiences that we've been doing all, during the years, uh, projects like Sound Manager, first version and second version allowed, a hi allowed us to use a hybrid approach in which uh, we had uh, uh, available audio behavior, HTML5 audio behavior, and flash fallbacks. So it was easy to uh, keep up with uh, Chrome, Firefox, IE, and create uh, sound. But everyone was demanding something better, something more, more professional, something that had more power, which was the the web audio API. For a, for a while there, there was the Mozilla audio data API. Uh, it proposed a different approach. Um, they wanted everything to be made with JavaScript, so you would have your uh, frequency analysis or all your filters. They would be uh, JavaScript code, while the web audio API provides uh, a native uh, approach to all these uh, basic functions when you deal with uh, sound processing. So that's basically basically what, what the Wubadi provides allows developers to manipulate and play audio assets on web page or applications. It goes beyond that. Some people have said that web audio is to the HTML5 audio, what Canvas is to the image element. Um, I think uh, we wish that were the case because. Canvas is very limited in that aspect. Um, it's more like if we had Canvas, and Canvas could do um, color filtering and Photoshop blending and all that. Uh, Web Audio API provides way more uh, features than Canvas. So how do you use? You basically have to instantiate uh, an audio context. That's your object. And you create a with with that define uh, that uh, declaration. And usually, you just use one context per page, um, usually because you just want everything to go into the mixer. Everything has to go into the user's output system, usually the speakers or the headphones. And once you've got all this instantiated, you can start creating your routing graph, your adding nodes to the system. So. Web Audio API, um, it's based on nodes. It's one of these APIs that works with nodes. So all the basic audio operations, like playing a sound, changing the volume, adding some, some filter, are performed by nodes. 
the nodes get connected together in a, in a graph, which defines the behavior of that sound system. They're connected by their inputs and outputs. And that allows a lot of flexibility when you try to create um, basic playback systems or sound post-processing or dynamic uh, behavior to, to sound. So these are some examples of routing graphs. The one on the top, it's a very basic one in which you can see that there's a source, not a specific source. It can be anything that provides sound into the system. It's connected to a bicode filter, which is a second order filter. It does something, and it goes to the destination, which is usually the speakers. And the one on the bottom, it's a way more complex system in which there's three sources, that there's three sources several distortions, it creates two paths. One is the dry part that's unprocessed, and the other one is the wet part. It's uh, got a convolution applied, and then it got uh, all together again into the destination. So basically, you have to get your system clear in your head, and then that's the graph that you're going to implement. And it's really easy. I mean, don't get intimidated by the, these weird graphs. So basically, We've got sources. Sources, it's our main uh, way of putting data into the system. Something has to make noise. Something has to provide us with, with uh, uh, an audio data. Um, I'm going to talk about the four main ways you can put um, sound into Web Audio API, which are the create buffer source, create media element source, create media stream source, and create oscillator. And basically, the way you use them, it's once you've got your context, you create your source. In this case, it's a buffer source, audio buffer source. That creates a node, an audio buffer source node. Um, I have to apologize because it's going to get like a tongue twister at some points because it's going to be audio buffer node, node, audio node. It's going gonna, it's gonna to get. But there's, there's not that many words in the web audio API, so all the words are repeating most of the time. Then you assign a buffer, which is the, your data to the source uh, uh, audio buffer node, and you start it. This is actually not going to, I mean, this is going to play, but you're not going to hear anything because there's one important step missing, which is connecting the destination. So the destination is what you plug your uh, node into. So in the previous case, we had the, the same thing, create the context, create the buffer source, assign the buffer, connect it to the context destination, which is the end of our web audio chain, which is, again, usually the headphones. And you start the sound. And then you would hear it on your, on your headphones. But the combinations are endless. Once you've, get, you, you've got nodes, uh, you're able to create nodes, you can start connecting them. So here, there's an example in which you get an oscillator. Connected to a gain node, the gain node is connected to a convolver node, the convolver node is connected to a notch filter, and the notch filter finally goes to the destination. And this is dynamic. You can, you can change it at any time. You can, you can create dynamic effects, whatever you want. So speaking of the specific buffer source, which is probably the one you're going to be using the most because it allows you to play back a, 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 sound, a sound file, um, once you use the context create buffer source, the audio buffer source node has a few uh, attributes and, and methods. The most important one is buffer, which is an IEE 32-bit float ranging from minus one to plus one. This is your data, your raw data, which you would usually load with uh, an XML HTTP request. More about that later. So you assign it, and then you can change the playback rate, the playback rate tell if it's the, the source is looping, how should start looping or end looping. You can start it, you can stop it, and you can know when it's ended. OK, so this is the most common code that you see when you check for a tutorial on web audio. Create a context, create a request, an XML HTTP request because it's asynchronous. You have to specify the response type you want for this request. It's going to be an array buffer, so it's going to be loaded as a binary uh, data. And once you've got it on the on load, when you've got the request response, you use the context method that is called decode audio data, which will return a buffer that it's ready for the web audio API, for the audio buffer source node to play. 
So then you can connect it, assign the buffer to your source buffer node, and play it. I'm going to show you a demo. So this is basically the same thing. It's a bit different from what they tell you on the tutorials, because the first thing is that you're going to see, sorry, I'm going to make it a bit bigger. That's probably better. So the audio context, um, it's, since it's been experiment, an experimental technology, and as things go with web development, uh, things are prefixed with vendor prefixes, prefixes um, you have to check that you've got the right uh, audio context. So for Chrome stable right now, it's still WebKit audio context. In Canary, it's already the prefix, so it's uh, audio context. Mozilla has dropped the prefix. And Safari, I think, still has got uh, WebKit audio context. So basically, you've got this load sound method that will create the, will request a sound and will play it, like we've said before. And the only thing I've changed is that when I create the source, I change the playback rate, and I assign a random value so you can hear that it's not very exciting, but it's a start. So yeah, um, playback rate, note that it's got its playback rate dot value. That's weird. Why is that? Because um, usually you just assign a value. It's because it's an audio param, and we'll talk about that later. So they usually advise you to load these sounds uh, by using the XML HTTP request. There's one problem with this approach that it's, it's very convenient. It's asynchronous, so it doesn't block your, your main thread. But you have to download everything. I mean, this own load, it's only triggered when everything's downloaded. So you've got 30 megabytes MP3 for the, your sound. You have to wait for the whole sound, the whole buffer to be downloaded so you can play it. There's no um, the, the convenience of the HTML5 audio element in which you can auto, auto preload or auto buffer. Uh, it's not with this. Uh, it doesn't work with this uh, way of loading. But for several other sounds, at least it works. So probably you're good uh, to start with this, with this way. So, no, sorry. There's another thing. When you get this buffer out of the onload method, and then you pass it in the code that gives us a, a buffer, you cannot replay an audio buffer source node. Once uh, an audio buffer source node is played, it's done. You cannot play it again. It will throw an exception. So you have to keep the buffer and recreate your source, and then play it again. So a more convenient way of managing sounds, it's probably having a function that what it does, it's the same thing, only that stores the buffer into an audio buffer, and then you can have a play sound which creates the buffer source and plays it. It's exactly the same. Uh, it's going to sound the same as the one before. No problem. But this way, it's more convenient because it's not loading the same sound every time. It's just reusing the audio buffer. So um, I should go step by step into the more complex uh, notes, but I'm going to add something that's a bit more advanced because it's more convenient for, for, for a talk. So there's another, uh, another note that's very, it's very useful. That's the analyzer note, which allows us to perform a real-time analysis in the frequency domain and in the time domain, which is commonly called the fast Fourier transform. So when you get your data, your audio buffer, that's basically, when it's played back, it's on time domain. That's the classic um, audio shapes that you see. But uh, the visualizers and the equalizers and most filters work based on frequencies. So anal the, the analyzer node allows us to access that data. And the way you do it, it's create a, an analyzer, set the fast Fourier transform size, which is the number of samples that you want your transform to have. This is all sound engineering and, and mathematics stuff, you only have to know that this should be a power of two, usually 256 samples, 512. And then you provide uh, your own buffer in which the get float frequency data or get byte frequency data is going to store that information. And then you can use it. So in this case, for instance, this is getting more and more complex. But still, we create the audio context. 
we create the buffer, and then we create an analyzer node. We set it to 256 samples. We create this frequency data array of uh, bytes, u int 8 array. We create a canvas because we want to sh see what's in that uh, spectrum. We want to plot it. And then the rest is the same. We have the load sound. We have the play sound function of before. The only difference is that when we create the play sound, we're connecting it to the analyzer. And the analyzer is connected to the output, to the context destination. And the function update, which is called with request animation frame, basically just takes the, that, that frequency by get by frequency data into frequency data array and plots it. So that's basically what we have. And then we can see the frequencies of what we're sending into the analyzer. So the funny thing of this is that we are creating several buffer source nodes in parallel every time I click. All those nodes are connected into the analyzer, so they get, when you, when you play several sounds, they get accumulated, and then they go to the destination. You can see that the frequencies kind of accumulate. So what this is telling us, it's the amount of energy on each frequency band. So this is very useful if you want to create some kind of visualization or some kind of, some kind of uh, sound reactive uh, application, because um, lower frequencies, this part of the spectrum is usually like, like the bass, like the, the grave notes, and the upper you go into the spectrum, it's higher uh, sounds. So usually like if you wanted to code your own MP3 coder, you would just uh, zero all these frequencies from this part uh, forward. or whatever you want. Basically, you just link it to something uh, on your page, on your game, and you make it react. So this is with a buffer source, same thing. And as I said, there are several ways of uh, putting sound into the system. And this one, it's not using load sound. It's using the WebRTC get user media. WebRTC, it's the technology in the browser that allows us to amongst many, many things, uh, access the webcam and access the, the, the microphone, or webcams or microphones, because there can be many connected to our system. So this navigator get user media prompts the browser to ask uh, the user to allow access to the, to, the, to, the, to the microphone. And notice that I've commented the, the part in which the analyzer is connected to the destination. So now you're not going to hear my, mm, if this works, Hello, hello. You can see the sound, but you cannot hear it, which is also convenient if you don't want your input feedback to go into the, into the, into the output. You just want to process it. So again, get user media. You have to check that it's uh, prefixed. Um, and what it does, it's once it prompts, like get user media, once it prompts the user to allow access, You've got a success callback with a stream, and then there's context create media stream source, and it creates a, a source node. And it behaves exactly the same as the audio buffer source node, uh, only that it doesn't have playback rate because you cannot make reality speak faster. OK. So now. We've seen the, that it's very useful to play uh, sounds or to access the, the, the input of the system. Uh, and we saw this um, audio param uh, type. This, it's, it's an object. It's, it's a type of a data type that's got some, some parts of the, of the API. So audio param is an interesting thing, and it's basically one of the, power, the most powerful uh, features of Web Audio API. It, it allows you to to schedule uh, events, to change values over time. So for instance, um, you can set a value at a time. That would be your, like your normal setter. You want a frequency, or you want a gain to be 100, and it's right now. That's easy. If you wanted it to go slowly into 120 or another value, you would probably have to implement your own easing or your own um, linear interpolation function. And deal with it. So basically what you get is when you use set value at time, you can say, I want this value to be 100 
now or in two seconds or whenever. So you can basically schedule everything from the very beginning you start, from the very moment you start, you can say, I want all this to happen. And then there's linear RAM to value at time. So it basically, you can say, OK, it's whatever it is now. I want in five seconds to go to zero, which is kind of a fade out. It's very cool. So please, if you implement mute on your web pages, fade them down. Fade the sound in and out. Because if you do an, an abrupt cut, it, it's grating. So. And exponential, like linear RAM to value, it's a linear interpolation. And exponential, it's, it's a curve. Uh, then there's a different, it's the set target at time. That one is a bit more complex. It basically says, uh, I want you to get into that value at this rate. So I don't care the time. I just want, it's like a fall off. It's, it's an implementation of a fall off value. And set value curve, you can specify certain values. And cancel scheduled values just removes all your schedule for your, for your sample, for your system, for anything you want. So I will show this with the, with the next uh, notes. Um, gain node, basically, it's a, a gain control node. It, it, it's basically the volume. Although in audio, gain, volume, power are different concepts that are in different measures. It's got, it's got one uh, attribute, which is gain, and it's also an audio param. So again, you can program it. You can schedule it. In this case, same thing, creating a context, creating a buffer source, Okay, creating a volume uh, node assigning the value to 0.1, that's basically the scale that is applied. It's a scaling factor to your, to your wave. So in this case, it would be 1 tenth. 1 would be no modification, 2 would be twice. And connect the source to the volume and the volume to the destination and play it. And you're done. So you can change, if you keep the reference to your volume uh, node, you can change it any way you want, and it would just change the volume. There's another node that it's delay node. It adds a delay conveniently. And basically, same thing. You create it with context create delay. You specify the maximum delay time that that node can process. And then you assign it with delay time, which is, again, an audio param attribute. So in this case, for instance, it's creating a source buffer with a sound, adding a delay of three seconds out of the 100 seconds that we've specified and playing it. So it would play three seconds after the actual start. So what, what it is, it, it can be used for, um, like reverb effect, uh, a very easy and cheap reverb effect. It's basically connecting uh, your buffer source to a loop between the delay and the gain nodes. They are looped. You can see it on the last lines that the audio source is connected to the delay node. The delay node is connected to the gain node. And the gain node is connected to the delay node. And the delay node is connected to the context destination. So it creates a feedback loop attenuating the value. So you get uh, this uh, echo uh, uh, reverb effect. So I'm going to show you this. It's, this is basically the same thing, creating the context, creating the analyzer, creating the, uh, the, the canvas to show it, loading the sound, and playing the sound. It's what we've seen. It creates the audio source. Sets a random playback rate and creates the loop and just plays it. And what you get is this same sample, but you can hear that echo. So that echo is created by a reverb effect, not using anything fancy, just a loop of delay and, and gain. So it's basically that. So you've got the echo with a few with a delay and it's attenuated, so you lower the gain and the same sound goes on and on. You can run into feedback loops with, with, with this. You have to be careful. Another source, it's the oscillator source. Uh, there's, uh, you create it with create oscillator and assign a type. There's uh, five types. Sine wave, square wave, sawtooth, triangle, and custom. If you use custom, you have to specify how's your custom cyclical wave with set wave table. And Again, there's a frequency that it's an audio param, so you can specify a, a frequency that you, you want your oscillator, your LFO, to work, and you can schedule it, you can ramp it, you can, you can do lots of, of things with it. So basically, you can start creating your own 
uh, synthesizer with, with oscillators. Same thing, create the other context, create the oscillator, assign a frequency value, the type. Mm, important thing, that's one of these things that are on Flux, and some APIs accept a string stating the triangle or sawtooth, the type, and some other APIs, I think it's uh, Safari implementation, they require the number. So keep that in mind. Connect the oscillator to the, to the destination and start it. Uh, ah, okay, sorry. Okay, filters. Um, this is, this is a, a very useful uh, type of node. It creates a second order filter and it's got uh, all these types. Low pass, so only lower frequencies. Below the frequency attribute are let through. High pass, the opposite, only frequencies over that frequency are let through. Band pass, only frequencies around that uh, frequency in the Q attribute are allowed to pass. Low shelf and high shelf are like uh, low pass and high pass, but again is applied, so you can amplify those frequencies. Same with picking. It's like band pass, but with, with, with amplification. A notch filter, it's the opposite of a band pass. It just allows everything to pass except a specific uh, band. And all pass basically just applies some uh, shift delay or a gain. So in this case, for instance, I'm going to show you. So um, I'm creating um, up there an oscillator with a sawtooth type. I'm assigning a value and then a filter, which is also, I think it's a uh, seven. It's a not not or is it? I don't know. I don't even know right now. With numbers, I, I don't remember. And what I'm doing is hooking the the mouse movement to change. And you can see here that I'm doing the frequency of the filter. It's changing to a value as, uh, uh, related to the to the position of the mouse at the context current time plus 0.1. So in one tenth of a second, it's going to go to that value. Context current time, it's very convenient when you're scheduling uh, events because it tells you exactly the moment in which you are in time. It starts from zero when you create the context and it progresses uh, while it's running. So you can say, okay, this is my now. So now plus one second, do this. You don't have to keep track of time. And the same thing for the, for the, for the source, for the oscillator frequency. So you get this. So vertical is frequency of the, the oscillator. And horizontal, it's the cutting frequency of the filter. You can see how the frequencies go up and down. So if you want to create a radio, it's probably what you, what you need to do. It's, it's a very lame demo, but that's basically what, what started with the, the 303, the, all the MOOC, all the Corks, all the Roland uh, sound machines. So you can, you can, you can create sound tables with, with this. So convolution. Whoa. Um, convolution, I mean, if you, if you know what it is, it's cool. If you don't know it, just use it and forget about it. So basically, yeah, no, that's, that's how these things work, because the, the theory, it's, it's mind-boggling, but uh, it's actually really simple to use. Um, a convolution effect, it's basically, you've got uh, a sample, in this case, uh, that um, it's characterizes the dynamic response of a system. So for instance, when you do this, this echo that you hear, it can be recorded, and when you have a different sample sound, you process it with that sample and a convolver uh, node, and it adds all this echo and all these char dynamic characteristics of the environment you sampled, what is called the impulse response. So you can search the internet, find w wave files or MP3 files, which are uh, impulse response in a cathedral, in a, in a, inside a metallic tank. Create a context co uh, convolver, assign that buffer, which is loaded exactly the same as an audio buffer source with XML HTTP request, 
and uh, apply it. Everything you put on your system before a convolver, it's going to turn into that uh, environment. So demo time, same thing. We create the, the, the canvas, the visualizer. We do a, use the load sound two times because we're going to load our original sample and the cathedral uh, impulse response. Then create a convolver and assign it to our uh, audio buffer source. And this creates this. It creates all this complex texture of, of sound out of a single. Uh, I mean, if you try to do this with uh, all set of nodes of delay, gain, filters, it would be really, really long. And this is very convenient. You just stick a, a, an audio file, and you get this uh, impulse response. Because you think that you, you would probably have to calculate for I don't know materials and the, the way different frequencies uh, bounds of the materials you're modeling. So this this is pretty this is pretty cool. And I think this is the last one I'm, I'm going to cover. It's the panner, which it's also very cool if you're creating games or some kind of immersive experience. It allows you to create the spatialization effects by doing a very simple thing. So basically, when you can instantiate a, a panner node, you can define the position, the velocity, the direction, and the focus, or the, or the, the cone, the sound cones. Like, it can be omnidirectional, or it can be very directional. So you move your sound with all its effects, all its notes, you move it in 3D. And then, it's tied to the audio listener, which is context listener, which also you can specify the position, the velocity, and everything, which is you. It's the, the listener. So once you've got this running, basically, it calculates everything. Like if, it's a, if, the, if the source is far away, it's going to get attenuated. If it moves fast towards you, it's going to calculate the Doppler effect, and it's going to shift the frequency accordingly to your relative speeds. So that's Awesome, like it's out of the box. You just use it. There's there's a more thorough tutorial about this uh, on HTML5 rocks, and I, I, I recommend you to to look at it because it would take longer than the time I have for the for the talk. And that's it. There's some others like you can split channels and merge them again. The Dynamics compressor tries to prevent from clipping and getting things out of hand. So you should just stick it in the end of your chain before the context destination. You can create periodic waves, wave shaper, also complex things. And JavaScript node, that's the, like the shader of, of, of 3D graphics. It's, it allows you to do anything you want with the input and the output. So anything that you want to do that it's not provided by the default nodes, you can just create it there. You want to do a pitch shift uh, effect. You take the frequency, you shift it, you turn it back into, into time domain, and let it go. So there's plenty of those. There's, those are pretty much uh, more complex and require a bit of um, sound programming knowledge. So what you saw, the, the, the demo I was playing before, uh, there's 50 cubes. Each cube has a, a sound loop for itself. It's got an a proximity activated sound. It's got uh, an activated properly, like when it lights. Uh, the activation sound, each node has a different analyzer, which is also connected to the microphone. It's got a panner, so you can place it around in 3D. Then there's an atmosphere that it's playing also with its own node. There's a, a convolver to add uh, some reverb. There's a filter for the sake of it, and a dynamics compressor to, to try to keep everything uh, under control. And it's, it's basically, so now all this sound, all this texture, it's created out of a lot of different sounds. Um, the sound system is really good, but it's not doing justice to the, to the sound. With headphones, it's, it's way more intense. So you can hear all this complex behavior out of scheduling events, and you can even, um, you have to 
reload, sorry. And it will ask, okay. So the sound, the, 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 the vibration of the light, it's based on its own sound, but it's also. You can, use all, you, you can also use your microphone. So if you want to do something with um, some installation, something that is interactive, something that the, the, the users can interact with, this is, this is, this is a pretty awesome um, technology. So you can hear, like, when you get closer. That's feedback. That's not me. And you can hear the sounds when you go over the sound source. So it creates a very complex texture very easily. So I'm going to blow this demo, and you can see how it's created for its, uh, for its cube. And it's, it's not that difficult. So awesome. Now what, what you can do with, with, with all this uh, technology, there's um, WebRTC get user media, so you can start doing um, cool interactions with users on the web page by allowing them to, to talk into the, into, the, into the web page and doing whatever. I don't know, sky's the limit. There's also the web media API, uh, which it's not only for stupid sounding songs, it's actually an interface so you can use MIDI keyboards or any MIDI device plugged into your computer and then use um, all the shift uh, levers and all the events and everything, like sound machines, everything you, you, you want. You can go with procedural sound generation for games or for sites or for the sake of it, creating an audio, uh, an audio uh, JavaScript node and putting things into the system or using uh, oscillators. Or you can use real-time effects like specialization or um, you can have your site, it's playing a soundtrack, and if the user goes underwater, you can muffle the frequencies so it sounds like it's underwater. Um, these are the references, I think. I mean, there's lots of them, but better stick to the latest spec. There's a few um, clashing versions of the spec, so be careful. Some, some you have to create a game node, and some you have to create a game. So. The syntax uh, differs sometimes. And both tutorials, I mean, any tutorial on HTML5 rocks, it's awesome. So these two, the getting started and the mixing position on audio on WebGL, those are really, really good. And that's it. Thanks. I know. Questions, you can find me here.